Welcome to Reversing Hashimoto show. I am your show host Dr. Anshul Gupta, the world expert in Hashimoto's disease. I help people reverse their thyroid conditions by making personalized functional medicine plans. You can work with me with any part of the country now by making virtual functional medicine appointments. To book an appointment, look at the show notes. In this show, I am going to get experts from all over the world. who are going to share latest information that will help you to reclaim your life back from dreadful thyroid disease so welcome here and uh, we have a lovely guest dr amy honaman today with us dr amy honaman aka is a thyroid fixer is a woman on a mission to optimize thyroid patients around the world and give them their life back using her proprietary transformational program the fix method she is also the founder of the institute for thyroid and hormone optimization after her own experience of insufferable symptoms misdiagnosis and improper treatment dr amy set out to help others who she knew were going through the same set of frustrations and who were on the same medical roller coaster dr amy thank you so much for being here that is a inspirational story Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Great, wonderful. Well, we have so much to talk about today, and I think we are going to talk about all about thyroid labs, Hashimoto's labs. There is so much misunderstanding in the world about what are the normal labs, what labs people need to get, and what are the optimal values. So we'll definitely would like to talk all about it. But before we go into the details, we'll actually like to hear your story about how you struggled with thyroid diseases. Yeah. So like many of us in this health space, it was a pain to purpose story. So if we back up 20 some years ago, I was actually competing. I was competing in figure competitions and doing some fitness modeling. So basically you had to have a very, very strict diet regimen and often i was going to the gym a couple times a day everything was was tight and very strict and i had done this multiple times before i had competed before i had done other photo shoots before and this one particular time i was in the process of getting ready for a show and the scale started going up instead of down so it biologically didn't make sense to me based on what i was eating and how i was working out and how my body had responded before it didn't make sense that the scale was going up so i was getting frustrated and i mean it was it went up 20 pounds i stopped weighing myself after 20 pounds because i was getting so frustrated so i did what we all do we go to dr google or maybe it was even i don't know the the library with microfiche at the time it was so long ago and we start researching and then going to doctors so you go to your first doctor you say hey doc and this happened to be my sister which is kind of funny story she was the first one to misdiagnose me i go to my sister i'm like listen i'm tired all the time i'm gaining weight this isn't making sense you see what i do you know i've competed before you know how my body's supposed to respond what's going on so she ran some tests that we'll get into today i have no idea what those tests were because this was long before i was in the functional medicine space but she ran some tests and gave everything's fine you're normal normal air quotes everything's fine so i went on to it, and did i not believe her no i but i i was frustrated like most of us are i had these symptoms that weren't going away by the sixth doctor six i was crying in my car head down praying to god that something was wrong because if something was wrong that would give me a reason why my body was rebelling against me Six doctors all told me you're fine, you're normal. Eat less and exercise more, which I thought there's absolutely no way that I can possibly eat less and exercise more than what I'm already doing. And no one was giving me the answer. Seventh doctor finally did the I guess at least enough testing and touched my throat and said swallow. And she said, "You have a goiter. You have hypothyroidism. Here's some Synthroid." 5 months later nothing changed not 1 pound loss not 1 iota of feeling better so again went back to dr google found a functional medicine practitioner so that was my first exposure to functional medicine and he did all the right tests addressed the underlying conditions treated me supplementally we changed my nutrition we did use medication as well 
totally got my life back. And that was so eye opening. He's now my mentor today, still to this day. And that was so life changing that it, it changed the trajectory of my career. So I went into functional medicine, obviously with a focus on thyroid and hormones because of what I went through. And I was in a major city. So if of Pittsburgh PA, so if I was going through that, I knew other people were too. And that's a frustration that I didn't want anyone to have to go through, even though many still are, you know, that's why we're in this space just to help one person at a time. So that was my story of how I landed here. Wow. That is amazing. I mean, I'm so sorry that you had to go through so much stuff before finally like getting the final diagnosis and getting the right treatment. And, you know, many people do. I mean, I think we all have that story, which leads us into the realm of helping others because of what we, we go through. So it's really a blessing at the end of the day. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, we always say that, you know, we all have our stories and we have gone through like, you know, these miseries and these frustrations. So that's the reason we understand what our patients have to go through. Yes. So I'm sure that, you know, all that experience of yours, you know, is helping so many patients to like leading their health transformation now. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. So let's talk about these labs, you know, like, you know, obviously, you know, like, you know, there are like some labs which were run, which was not enough, you know, and several of my patients also, when they come to see us, they have had only a few labs and a lot of their labs have been normal before, like, you know, final diagnosis has been given. So tell us a little bit more about these labs of the thyroid patients or Hashimoto's patients they should get. Absolutely. So what you and I always see is patients coming in and they went to their doctor and they asked for a full thyroid panel. Maybe they heard from a friend or heard us talking or saw it on Facebook. Hey, go get your thyroid checked. And that's all they're told. Get your thyroid checked. So they go to their doctor. They say, hey, I really want this, this thyroid panel. I want, I want my thyroid checked. And most doctors, 99% of them are going to run just a TSH. Now, maybe you might get lucky and get a free T4 with that, but most of them are just going to run TSH and they're going to base their diagnosis off of that number alone. And if I, if I could go back and look at my lab from 25 years ago, I would probably see just that. I would see the TSH and nothing else. And that does not give us the full picture of what's going on with someone's thyroid. Because TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And that is not a thyroid hormone. That is a pituitary hormone. I always like to use analogies when I'm getting people to understand something. So I use the analogy of kind of like a, a, a blind man finding his way, right? So the pituitary is going, hey, is there enough thyroid hormone in the body? Yeah? Okay, I'm happy. And it doesn't, it can stay actually in the functional medicine optimal range because it's sensing that there's enough thyroid hormone. So it doesn't have to yell at the thyroid. Now, when it starts to sense that there's a problem, and this is just like when you're yelling at your kids, right? You start off low and you're like, Johnny, please go over and pick up your toys. And then Johnny doesn't. And then you go a little bit louder, Johnny, you gotta go over and pick up your toys. And that is the TSH as it gets higher, you are more hypo. The thyroid isn't listening to the pituitary yelling at it saying, hey, thyroid, wake up and do your job here. There's not enough going on in the system. This person's suffering. Wake up. Now, if it goes high, if that TSH actually starts to go up, then your doctor might go, hey, Susie, there's a problem here. But what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't move out of that range? Or what if it even stays in the what we don't, where we don't like to see it above a two, but what if it stays in the standard lab value range? You won't get a diagnosis and you'll continue suffering with your symptoms because you won't have an answer. We have to, have to, have to move on from that, that lab range or that lab value and test more. So we have to do the free T4. Now free T, T4 is the inactive thyroid hormone. I like looking at free T4. I don't hang my hat on free T4. We have to keep going. And now we go into free T3. So T3 is the active thyroid hormone. T4 is inactive. Why wouldn't we want to look at how much active thyroid hormone is in your body? That's a key marker because every cell in your body has a receptor site on it for T3. 
you do not have receptor sites for T4. And we can get into the conversion in a moment. But you don't have receptor sites on your cells for T4. So in order to have a metabolism and lose weight and feel good and have your brain working and be able to poop every day, you need T3. So we have to know how much free, unbound T3 is in your body ready to get to that cell. That is a very, very important lab value. And oftentimes that will be low. It might still come in in the standard lab value range within normal limits. But if it's low, that's telling me you don't have enough of the active thyroid hormone. No wonder you feel so bad. No wonder you can't lose weight no matter how hard you try. No wonder your hair is falling out. So we look at that, that lab value and then we keep going. We go on to reverse T3 and we can deep dive into reverse T3, but reverse T3, that's your brakes. If free T3 is your gas, reverse is the brakes. And I'll, I use another analogy too, because it will, now this is kind of debated in the functional community, but I, I still use it because I believe in it. When reverse T3 is high, it is like a bouncer outside of the club telling T3 they can't get in. Literally standing outside of your cell door going, okay, T3, uh, yeah, you're not coming in. Yeah, you're not coming in either. And it will prevent T3 from getting to that receptor on the cell to do its job. So reverse T3 literally is putting the brakes on your body. Now it's built into us as a survival mechanism. We need reverse T3. If you're laying in the ICU or the ER and you're injured and you're fighting for your life, we want that reverse T3 high because you don't have to burn fat right then and there. You need to survive. You don't have to feel good. You need to survive. So reverse T3 is built into us as a survival mechanism, but I don't want reverse T3 high when you're trying to walk around living life every day, you're trying to go to work, you're trying to raise your kids, you're trying to clean your house, you're running a business, whatever you're doing, you don't want your body in survival mode, shutting down every single process in your body with that reverse T3 being elevated. So we have to, have to, have to test for that. And I'm sure you hear this from your patients too, Dr. Gupta, but all the time I have patients come to me and go, well, my doctor said that they don't do that except in a clinical setting. No kidding. It's going to be high in a clinical setting, just like we talked about. It's going to be high if you're laying in the, in the ER, in the ICU, but we don't want it high. So it makes no sense to not test it. We don't want it high when you're walking around trying to live life. Have to test that. Free T3 and reverse T3 are the two most important tests that I look at right off the bat. And then of course, we do want to check for Hashimoto's. We want to know whether or not you have an autoimmune condition. What, what your hypothyroidism is caused by. And we know that about 90% of all hypothyroidism is autoimmune Hashimoto's, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's where we test the TPO, thyroid peroxidase, and we test the thyroglobulin, TGA. You would be amazed at how many doctors only test one. There are two markers. There are two antibodies to test for Hashimoto. So we want both of those. Now, if you want to throw in a total T4, total T3, the T3 uptake, those are, those are what I call bonus tests over here. Th those are bonus. So yeah, you can toss them in. Great to look at. Fantastic. But the ones that I just listed, those are the most important to really get the full picture of what's going on with your thyroid and with your health. And it gives us a ton of answers just with those lab values alone. Absolutely. Hopefully I mean, that was a, a thorough explanation of the <laughs> thorough and passionate explanation of the thyroid test. No, actually, I actually need it. You know, like, you know, you pointed so correctly that so many patients just get the TSH and the values in normal range and they suffer from symptoms for several years sometimes before finally, like, you know, a doctor like you, you know, or a functional medicine doctor order the whole panel and their T3 is either down the dump or as you said, the reverse T3 is so high. This is not letting the body function. So, and then, you know, like there's so many things that can be done, which, you know, obviously we'll go into the details a little bit later on to improve these numbers. But first of all, we need to know, you know, what we are dealing with so that we can take the right steps. And you pointed yes. out very like, you know, important thing is that, you know, the range, the optimal range of these tests is, is can be different, you know, from the functional medicine aspect as compared to the normal standard lab. So why don't you talk a little bit more about that now? Absolutely. This is so important too, because as you hear, as I hear from many people, well, my doctor told me I was normal 
everything is within normal limits. Everything is normal. And there is normal, which is your standard lab value range. That's when you grab your labs and you look over to the side of whatever marker that is, and it has a range, you know, zero to hundred or, or whatever the range might be. Now that range is like the side of a barn. So if I set you back 20 yards and I give you a ball and I say, here, hit the side of the barn, you're going to hit it. But if I put a teeny tiny little marker on the side of the barn, that's your bullseye. And I say, make sure you hit the center of that bullseye. You may or may not hit it. And, but that bullseye, that's the optimal lab value range. That's where in functional medicine, we say, we have seen enough people to know that you are going to feel your best in that range. Now, some people fall outside the range and they're still optimal and they're living life and they feel great. And some people need actually to be even above that range or below that range in order to feel great. That's where really personalized medicine comes in. But in general, we want to completely forget about the standard lab value range. Forget about what's on your lab panels. You know, just because you don't have an H and L, just because it's not red, does not mean that there's not a problem. So we have to look at things from an optimal standpoint. An example would be TSH. TSH has been debated for decades. It used to go all the way up to a 10. Then some endocrinologists spoke out and they went, hey, wait a minute, we're seeing some uh, thyroid problems even you know, between a six and a 10. So they lower it to a six. Now it's a 4.5 on most lab value ranges and still in functional medicine, we say, let's cut that off at a two. If you're above a two on your TSH, I'm gonna look a little bit further because that's a problem. And quite frankly, even if you are a 1.5, even if you are a 0.5, I am still going to look at each and every lab value that we discussed because I really wanna see that full picture. Many people will have a normal TSH even optimal TSH, and they will still have hypothyroidism or Hashimoto. So when we start dropping down that list, free T4, I like it around a 1.5, but I've seen people optimal less than that. I like to move down to those important markers that we talked about, free T3. Free T3 in most lab value ranges, optimal is 3.5 or above or in the upper quadrant. So I say the upper quadrant because many people are from the UK, Australia, you're going to even, even here in the US, we have between LabCorp and Quest, there's sometimes different ranges where it will be cut off. So in the upper quadrant of that range, that's where I want your free T3. And some people even do better above that range. And that does not necessarily mean that you've moved into a hyper thyroid state. It means that's where you are optimal. So we have to figure that out. In general, free T3, 3.5 or above, or the upper quadrant of the range. Reverse T3 is interesting because it's pretty universal throughout all countries. You will get cut off at 25. We want it below a 12. Remember, reverse T3 is the breaks. We don't want it high. We do not want too much reverse T3 in your system because that's your survival mechanism. I want to see that below a 12. That's where it's optimal. If it's above a 12, then I want to dig a little bit deeper and see what is causing that to go up. What's putting your body into that survival mode? Is it that you're taking T4 and you're not converting? Do you have high insulin? Are you estrogen dominant? Are you anemic? There are so many things that can cause elevated reverse T3. If that goes above a 12, we have to dig a little bit deeper and find out why. And then the TPO and TGA antibodies are interesting too, because oftentimes with those, you'll see... And this varies from lab to lab, but you'll normally see a, a less than, less than 20, less than 34. That's where you are totally fine. No Hashimoto is present. I disagree. I want those antibodies at zero. And if they're not at zero, if you have nine antibodies, but the range is less than 20, in my world, you have nine soldiers that are going out and attacking your thyroid. And maybe you're not full-blown Hashimoto's right now, but you will be because those soldiers are going to grow and they're going to multiply and they're going to keep going out and beating up your thyroid. So the question is, do we address it now or do we wait until you're 20 pounds heavier and can't get out of bed till we finally address it? And that's really the answer that many patients get from their doctor. Watch and see. We'll watch and see. Okay, well, I'm feeling like garbage right now. So like I said, are you going to wait until I can't even work anymore? Until I can't fit into any of my clothes, until I'm so depressed that all my relationships are ruined because I don't want to even get dressed and go out? Is that when we're going to finally 
maybe wake up and look at my labs and from a different light. No, we want to start at the beginning. We want to like the title of this summit, we want to reverse your Hashimoto's. We want to do it now. And we want to catch it in an early stage so that you don't get worse. So that's why I like TPO and TGA at zero. Awesome. Great. I mean, that's so much good information. I'm sure people are taking notes over here because, you know, like these number values are so confusing. Even for a lot of functional medicine doctors, it takes years and years of practice and kind of you know, knowing these values to find them that optimal mix. So, so that is great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this reverse T3 because you know, like that's, as you said, is a very big kind of concern about debate. Even a lot of functional medicine doctors do not believe that reverse T3 should be measured on the regular basis. And, you know, like also we have heard about like different labs are not equipped properly to get the reverse T3. So why don't you share your experience in terms of whether you use regular labs, you know, like the Quest and the lab code to check the reverse T3 or your special lab checking it? Honestly, I, I, I prefer just blood, just serum labs. Go to your Quest, go to your lab core, grab a reverse T3. That's fine. But when we're testing reverse T3, we have to factor in uh, different different pieces of the puzzle. So number one, are you on T4? Are you on Synthroid, Levo, or are you even on NDT, like Armour Thyroid or NP Thyroid? So if you are taking T4, we have to check reverse T3 because there is a path that T4 can take. It's like, it's like the path diverge in the woods, which one are you gonna take? T4 can take this path, and convert over to free T3, which is, that's the optimal path. That's what we want to have happen. Or it can take this path and convert to reverse T3. And I always say the conversion of T4 to T3, even though it's been built into our bodies as a natural process, it is very, very difficult. And many, many things can get in the way, causing that T4 to go this way to reverse T3 instead. So we want to first take into account are you on medication? What kind of medication are you on? And that will give us ideas as to, do we have to lower the dose? Do we have to address other factors? Then we check the other factors. Insulin is the biggest one. I just had a patient last week, very, very interesting because like we just said, T4 converts to reverse T3. T3, by the way, does not convert to reverse T3. It does not. So I had a patient that was on T3 only, young, very obese. Her reverse T3 was like 27. It was off the charts. It was actually flagged high in the standard lab value range. It was higher than the cutoff of the standard lab value range, let alone way beyond optimal. And then I looked at her insulin. Now, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, high insulin levels, high blood glucose levels, high A1C levels, are a huge contributor to inflammation in the body and will absolutely push up reverse T3. I looked at her insulin, Dr. Gupta, it was a 56. I don't think I've ever seen an insulin number at a 56 before. Uh -huh. It was so high. She was a young type two diabetic. Her A1C was a 6.7. And that alone was the answer as to why her reverse T3 was so high. And it was interesting because her mother was so focused on give her more thyroid medication, give her more thyroid medication. I said, there is not enough thyroid medication in the world to overcome that insulin number. You need to bring down that insulin number first. That has to be our, our, our focus because nothing else will happen if that stays high. Her reverse T3 will stay elevated. Her bouncers will not allow the T3 to get into the cell and she'll continue gaining weight and she'll continue suffering. It will be this vicious cycle. So we had to focus on the, on the insulin first. So insulin is a big one, Ex, uh, excess estrogen, estrogen dominance, which is so prevalent in men and women that we have to look at that too, because high estrogen levels will push up reverse T3. Like I said earlier, being anemic, not having enough ferritin, improper levels of iodine, magnesium, zinc, selenium, all of those vitamin D, all of those nutrients have to be checked too, because if those are off, that will drive up reverse T3 as well. And then there are a couple genetic SNPs that aren't readily tested for in day-to-day in -day medicine, 
we we're hearing more and more about genetics these days, and there are different ways to test for these SNPs, but the DIO1 and DIO2 genetic markers, if those are, if those SNPs are present, then that can indicate that a person just simply doesn't convert very well either, and reverse T3 will go up. So I have stress, lack of sleep, I and mean, there's so many things. So you can see why reverse T3 can go up pretty darn easily because there's so many things can, can, that can cause it to go up. Wow. So there is not just one reason. There are multiple reasons, you know, where the reverse T3 can go up. So it is very important to check it, you know, so that we know that, you know, it is high. And then so second of all, to know the exact reason, why is it going high? So that can be addressed mm -hmm. after that then. Yes, exactly. And oftentimes when you address the cause of the reverse T3, then you don't have to necessarily throw more thyroid medication at a person. You might need to adjust their medication or adjust their dose, but treating that, that root cause of the reverse T3 ultimately helps the thyroid hormone get into the cell and do its job. Right. So we see it very often that, you know, in our practice also, then when we are able to reduce the reverse T3, that, you know, several people, doses of the medicines are being able to reduce and some people are even able to get off of it. So, so that definitely, you know, like we see in a practice. So that's, so that's amazing. So, I mean, we talked about, you know, like, you know, the reasons, you know, why the reverse T3 is high, what things, you know, have you seen that are beneficial to bring this reverse T3 down then? Going back to what I just said, bringing down that insulin. Oh, that is so important because so many, first of all, with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, we know the thyroid is the master gland. We know that it controls all of our other hormones. So insulin, remembering that insulin is a hormone, I see in really, again, about 95% of hypothyroidism and Hashimoto cases, I see insulin resistance. Now it might not be an insulin level of 56, 57, but I will see insulin levels above a six. I will see that A1C starting to creep upwards towards a six, even, you know, 5.6, 5 5.7, 5 that's, that's insulin resistance. That is tiptoeing your way into diabetes, full-blown type two diabetes. So when we focus on bringing that insulin down, and I always say high insulin is the fastest way to age as well. It, it brings on the neurological diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's faster. We know that cancer cells feed on sugar. So high insulin is going to feed a cancer cell. So the fastest way to age is keep your insulin high. By bringing down that insulin, you do such a service for the body. You're reducing the overall inflammation in the body and you are reducing that reverse T3 ultimately because you're lowering that, that inflammation. You're lowering that hormone that will cause fat storage, cause inflammation and cause reverse T3 to go up. So that really is my, my very, very first focus. Really at the same time, almost as important, I do look at hormone levels as well. And, and every single person, I want to see estradiol, estrone, progesterone, free and total testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone. I want to see those sex hormones because we know if testosterone is low, that can be a stressor on the body. Whether you're male or female, testosterone is not just a male hormone. Females need optimal levels of testosterone as well. So if that's low, I see increase, and this is documented in the medical literature as well, increased risk of Hashimoto's and increase, increased burden on the body because, and an increased symptoms as well if testosterone is low. If estrogen is high, again, that's going to push up reverse T3. And with estrogen, we have to do a ratio of estrogen to progesterone because it's not just, oh, my estrogen's high because it was flagged with an H on my lab work. We have to look at what's your estrogen and then what's your progesterone. I will see 20 and 30 year olds with progesterone levels that of a postmenopausal 70 year old woman. And because that progesterone is so low and it's not there to balance the other hormones, estrogen is in a dominant state because when you look at that ratio, it's off. Progesterone is way low. Estrogen is now technically elevated, even though it's not flagged high. So estrogen dominance is a huge issue. And so many people, I'm sure you see this too. So many people are anemic. So many people are anemic. I mean, from, from having heavy cycles in their twenties and thirties and, and having hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, having that thyroid condition screw up their menstrual cycles, 
heavy cycles, not eating enough meat, uh, because we heard meat was bad back in the 90s or early 2000s. So I see so many people with so many patients with anemia, and that's another big driver. And then I think we really stop focusing on the importance of iodine. As you know, the, the community, the functional community is split in terms of whether they recommend iodine for Hashimoto's. You know, a lot of people say, no, 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 it's bad, bad, bad. It's going to, it's going to push you into a hyper state and then hypo state. And over here we say, we have the, the community that says, well, yeah, but um, iodine deficiency raises reverse T3 and you don't want to be iodine deficient because every cell needs it and it boosts your immune system and it protects against breast cancer. So it's kind of which side do you, do you want to play on? I, I tend to go more towards down the middle, not high doses of iodine. I don't avoid iodine. Yes, I do believe iodine deficiency raises reverse T3. So sometimes we have to use get that person out of that iodine deficient state as well. Great. I mean, so what I understand is that, you know, we don't only have to check the thyroid hormones, you know, the TSH, the free T3, the reverse T3, but we also have to look at the whole complete picture of other hormones too. You know, just the estrogen, the progesterone, testosterone, because as you said, the deficiency of these hormones can certainly be a driving factor in causing, you know, the Hashimoto's. And you pointed very well, you know, like, you know, checking iron levels, you know, like how many females that we see in our clinic have checked their iron levels or ferritin levels. You know, they get a CBC where their hemoglobin is checked, but nobody goes beyond that in checking their iron and ferritin. And yes. same with the insulin resistance, you know, like nobody, nobody ever checks insulin levels, right? The maximum right. people will, might get is an hemoglobin A1C. Again, as you said, that is an indirect marker, but we don't know the insulin levels. You know, research suggests that, you know, several years before the A1C becomes abnormal, the insulin levels are already high. So if yes. we check those, you know, we can actually identify insulin resistance, you know, search in early stage. So that's another very important test that, you know, like, as you mentioned, is so important for people to do. So it's not only the thyroid, it's so many different hormones that needs to be checked in Hashimoto's or thyroid patients to figure out what exactly is going on with them, right? Yes, 100%. Great. That's, that's so much good information. I'm sure like, you know, everybody is kind of, you know, taking notes and knowing, okay, what next test they need to get. Uh, so let's say like, you know, like people have got all these tests and, you know, their levels are high. Let's talk a little bit about like what things they can do now to kind of improve them. So let's, you know, like you pointed an important question about, okay, well, conversion of T4 to T3, that the conventional medicine thinks that, okay, yes, it is given that, okay, everybody's converting to T4 to T3, but we know that the conversion is not happening. So can people do something, people who are on Synthroid or Levoth Rocks, and can they do something to improve the conversion from T4 to T3? Absolutely. So if you are, I'll say, stuck in the Synthroid box, I, I, I gave a talk to a group of integrative practitioners years ago, and I was going over the testing that really should be done. And then I asked the question, why are you in the Synthroid box? Meaning that's all you prescribe where if someone comes to you and they're depressed and you try one antidepressant and that doesn't work, you'll try another one. If that one doesn't work, you'll try another one. If that one doesn't work, you'll stack on an anti-anxiety and, a, and a, a, an anti-psychotic medication on top of it until it does work. But with hypothyroidism, you prescribe one medication and that's it. Why? And the one doctor raises his hand and goes, that's all we've learned. So we have to think outside of the box for people that are stuck in the Synthroid box stuck on T4 only, which is, it, it's hard. It, I would say one in a thousand people, one in a thousand patients actually can feel better on T4 only. I will see them. I will have the occasional patient that when we do all the things to improve conversion, that they go, you know what? Yeah, my symptoms went away. I lost some weight. I feel good. My hair is growing back. But most of the time, people really need help with that conversion or they need to, to change medication. Now, if you're stuck inside of the Synthroid box and you can't change your meds, then let's do the checklist. Then let's check your insulin. Let's check your all of your nutrients, your iodine status, your hormones, and, and address it. So it might require supplementation because there are powerful supplements out there that really make a difference. I personally love berberine for lowering insulin. I had a, a, di a pure diabetic, a full-blown insulin-dependent diabetic with an A1C of a 13.9. And through the use of berberine, 
lifestyle changes, meaning reducing carbohydrate load because carbohydrates will increase your glucose and your insulin. So just by doing those two things in, it was six, six weeks, we got him off insulin. A1C came down to an 8.4. And in six months, his diabetes was reversed, dropped down to a 5.4. So that's the power of berberine. So I love using berberine for insulin resistance. And then even you know, doing biological hormones for low progesterone, addressing estrogen dominance with things like DIM or calcium deglucurate, making sure that the liver is healthy because hormones are metabolized in the liver. Everything is processed through your liver. And we live in a very toxic environment. Let's face it, the air you breathe, the water you drink, let alone the pesticides on your food, all have to be processed through the liver. So we wanna make sure that that's working as well for conversion. And just checking all of those boxes of, of factors that either interfere with or help with conversion of T4 to T3, will help that person that is stuck in that T4 only box and the stuck in the synthroid box to feel better because more of that T4 can be pushed over to T3. And then I'm sure you do this too, but I, I love using glandulars. I mean, glandulars are really, really close to natural desiccated thyroid medication. Let's face, I mean, but at least those glandulars contain a little bit of T3. So when someone is stuck on T4 and you use a glandular, Oh, it's like their, their world lights up again. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I could feel this way. Well, yeah, that's because you're so T3 deficient. We just essentially gave you T3 and pushed more of the T4 into T3. Of course you feel better. Now you're getting the active thyroid hormone into your cell. Absolutely. I mean, for some of the listeners, they might not know what the glandular thyroid is. So maybe if you can like, you know, just differentiate between the, the natural thyroid, let's just talk about the desiccated thyroid, the natural thyroid and the glandular thyroid. So people have an idea what we're talking about. Yes, absolutely. So to clarify, when I say NDT, I mean natural desiccated thyroid. So when we're talking about actual prescription medication, that would be nature thyroid, which I don't even think is around anymore. They pulled that NP thyroid armor, WP over in the UK. So there's different versions of NDT, which you need a script to walk into a pharmacy and obtain that NDT to use as medication. That is porcine thyroid gland. And a lot of you may, might maybe have compounding pharmacies as well. So compounding pharmacies will also use porcine thyroid gland, the thyroid gland that's dried, freeze dried out of a pig. Over here, you have the glandular supplements, and those are usually bovine out of a cow. So same thing, we are taking a cow's thyroid, we are freeze drying it, we are encapsulating it, and you are taking it. Now, all mammals have a thyroid, even your dog can have thyroid problems. So all mammals have a thyroid and we all produce, including humans, around, this is just an approximate because there's no way to actually test this for 100% certainty, we reproduce around 80% T4 and 20% T3 of our thyroid glands. Well, so do pigs and so do cows. So now we can take their thyroid and, and desiccate it, dry it out and encapsulate it and give it to you as a thyroid hormone replacement therapy. It's replacing your thyroid hormones that are no longer being properly made by your thyroid, whether you had a total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine, partial thyroidectomy, or you're in stage four, five, six of Hashimoto's where there's not much left of your thyroid gland and it certainly isn't producing an 80-20 split of T4 and T3, we can give you that to replace the thyroid hormones that are no longer being made. Now, oftentimes I'll have a patient that goes, I don't wanna go on medication. I don't wanna go on medication. I wanna go the natural route. Okay, well, NDT, natural desiccated thyroid medication is pretty darn natural, but we can go over here and use the glandulars too works pretty much the same way in the body. So it's a beautiful adjunct to, uh, you know, for our practice and for patients that, that they can utilize this and actually feel better on the glandulars. I do recommend, however, working with a practitioner when you're using the glandulars, because like I said earlier, they are powerful. They are as powerful as medication. So you don't want to be self-dosing and changing your dose because you do risk over-medicating yourself, pushing yourself into a hyper state. 
and, and you simply just don't know, you know what dose to do and how to dose the, the supplements properly either. So always work with a practitioner there. Great. You know, it's like, so at least for people who are on Synthroid, now they have some hope that, you know, they can work with a provider who's not ready to prescribe them, but at least getting glandular and work, you know, with a practitioner like you, who can support, you know, their T3 levels and that optimize the T4 functioning with it. Let's say, you know, if they don't have a prescription, you know, for the natural thyroid. So, so that's great. But you, you made an important point that it's very important to work with a provider when you're doing it glandulars, don't do it on your own because that's where people get into trouble. Yes, 100%. So that's great, you know, so that's wonderful. I mean, let's talk about some supplements, you know, because, you know, like uh, there are certain supplements which definitely can help people. Bourbon, as you said, is a wonderful supplement. Good for insulin resistance, also good for gut health. So, you know, it has multiple ways and multiple benefits. You know, obviously there are other supplements like zinc, selenium, you know, like vitamin D and magnesium and stuff. You know, tell me, tell us a little bit more about that. You know, how do you use them and what kind of benefits people can expect from them? Well, we want to use the supplements that are going to help with conversion, first of all. So we do want to use zinc. And I love using supplements that, like you said, with berberine, it has multiple purposes. So you get kind of a double bang for your buck. So with berberine, yes, you have the, the, the insulin lowering effect of it. And then it also carbs, curbs carb and sugar cravings, and it does have gut healing properties to it. And then when we look at something like zinc, yes, absolutely, it's going to help your hair because many hypothyroid Hashimoto patients have hair loss or hair thinning. It's going to help your immune system and it's going to help T4 to T3 conversion. So zinc is a big one. Magnesium, we are, mo most all of us are deficient in magnesium. So unless you take a magnesium supplement, you're not going to have adequate levels of magnesium for that T4 to T3 conversion to occur. But then let's also remember that magnesium helps with constipation, which many of you are suffering from because low thyroid, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, a non-optimized thyroid is going to cause slow motility in the bowel. So you, that's where you're experiencing the constipation. Magnesium helps with that. It helps with muscle cramping and muscle tightness. And then vitamin D, if you have Hashimoto's, that is an autoimmune condition, like we said earlier. With autoimmune conditions, we have to support the immune system. That's why we use zinc, but that's also why I use higher doses of vitamin D, especially in the case of Hashimoto's, because that is literally supporting the immune system and calming down that autoimmune attack. It's just, it's kind of letting all those soldiers just chill out and not go out and beat up your thyroid because everything is so supported. And then using things like selenium, but not overdoing it. I see a lot of patients taking 200 micrograms of selenium a day. We don't want selenium too high either. We want it just right. It's kind of like iodine and selenium are like the Goldilocks. We, just, we want it just right, not too high, not too low. And then using appropriate amounts of iodine. I, I, I like iodine. I'm not sure where you fall in that, in that two-sided argument, but I, I do like iodine for supporting the thyroid. Again, just from a, a biological standpoint, every cell needs iodine. Breast tissue, uh, fibrocystic breast disease, we see that go down, go away with the use of iodine. Um, some breast cancers, I can't say treated with, but some are very much improved by the use of iodine in addition to the thyroid. Now you have to, again, working with the practitioner is key here because you don't want to use too much. There is a, a breaking point at which you can kind of spill over and push yourself into a hyper state or even drop down into hypo. That is true, but I don't like avoiding it completely. I'm not in agreement with the practitioners that say avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. So I do believe that you need some. So those are probably my Oh, my favorite supplements, I would say um, DIM and calcium deglucurate for estrogen dominance. Um, I love collagen because that helps with gut healing and as well as hair because so many people, again, struggle with hair. And then a really nice, uh, like a ferrochel type of iron. So a nice, like easy on the GI tract iron where it's not going to cause more constipation because that's the last thing a hypothyroid patient's needs and is more constipation. So a nice gentle iron, if they are anemic to support those ferritin levels and get, get them out of that anemic state and help, help bring down the reverse T3. 
Great. You know, those are all like great tips. And I agree, like, you know, I'm also in the camp of iodine where, you know, you need a little bit of iodine support, but it's very important to look at all the supplements and all the sources of iodine in, in you know, where you're intaking. A lot of yes. people, you know, take multiple supplements and unfortunately, I think multiple of them have iodine in it and that's where they get into trouble. So I think, you know, like a little bit of iodine is great as a supplement that we need to add. Obviously, overdoing is where you get into trouble. So I think, you know, you are bang on target with that, that little bit of iodine support is important and is needed. And same with the iron, you know, like it's so important to get iron supplement, but the regular iron supplement people get it, you know, gets them constipated and that creates more trouble. So people just stop taking it. But, you know, people don't know that there are good quality iron supplements, you know, which do not get people constipated. So, so make sure again, you know, talk to uh, your functional medicine doctor or, you know, somebody like you to get on the iron supplements. So that's great. So, you know, I think we have discussed a lot and I'm sure, you know, we can keep going about, you know, these labs and other things, but, you know, our time is coming to an end. So just a last question. So we discuss about all these different labs, the thyroid labs, the hormonal labs that we can check, you know, the estrogen, the female hormones, the testosterone, as well as the insulin, the iron. So for the listeners, all of these labs, can they get it from regular labs by asking their provider or they have to go to a special lab to get it done? Oh, very good question. Okay, so my rule for asking for these labs from your doctor is you want to go in with a bulleted list of your symptoms. Do not write a book. Do not write out your life story. They will never read it. Don't write paragraphs. You want a bulleted list of your symptoms. So if it's you know, weight gain, 20 pound weight gain in three months, hair loss, fatigue, constipation, dry skin, whatever your symptoms are, write those out. And then give them all of the labs that we just talked about. And you say, you know, doc, I really want these tested because I'm dealing with all these symptoms over here. And I want to get that full picture of my health. Now, my rule is if your doctor says no to labs, it's time to get a new doctor because it's no money out of their pocket and no skin off their back to write you that lab order. So they should want to help you and want to know what is going on inside your body to better help you as your doctor. So that's, that's number one. Now, number two, occasionally I will have a patient that has every single lab done every single lab and they don't have the reverse T3 and they have a doctor that says no, but they don't want to leave that doctor. Okay. Then you can go to something like Alta labs and order your own labs, or I will have patients that have a very, very high copay and they want to, they, they don't want to pay the $2,000 to get all those labs. Well, you can get them all done at Alta for 500, 600, something like that. So there are places where you can order your own, even if you want to kind of piecemeal what you have and, and add in some of the labs that maybe you don't have, you can order them yourself. But ultimately you want to do that, that test of your doctor, so to speak, because if you're not with someone that will even order labs, you are with the wrong person. And whatever comes back on those labs, it's not gonna matter because that person isn't going to help you anyways. They wouldn't even order the labs to begin with. So I do prefer, I'm also very frugal with my patients. So I do prefer to go with blood when necessary. And then of course, if we want to check, we didn't even touch on adrenals. Oh my goodness. But if we want to check on adrenals because high cortisol can push up reverse T3 as well, then it might require a functional test. Or if we want to look a little bit deeper into the methylation of your hormones, we can do a Dutch test. But all in all, I, I just go by serum. I go by blood. I go by what your doctor can order for you if he or she is willing to. That is amazing. So that means people have options. You know, people, doctors, you know, who are great, you know, ready to work with them. They can get it through regular doctors. And if for unfortunate reasons, you know, they are doctors are not ready to work with them, then they can order these labs on their own so that at least, you know, they know the full picture. So, so that's great that people have options to and award these things. Yes. Great, wonderful. There was so much good information. I'm, I'm glad that you were able to share all this knowledge and kind of shed some light about, you know, all these labs that people need to get and what are the optimal levels about these labs and what do they mean? So at least people have more understanding about the disease now, because as you said, you know, like Hashimoto's disease or thyroid disorders have only been like dealt with just one lab. And now we know that there is more to it. So hopefully this kind of gives 
like hope for people to kind of who are still suffering or they want to kind of reverse their Hashimoto's that now they can get the full picture so that, you know, as you said, they can keep addressing one thing at a time. So that's great. So thank you so much, Dr. Amy. Can you, before we go, can you uh, tell our listeners, you know, like uh, where they can find you and where in, uh, how they can find you and how they can reach you? Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me on, by the way. And you can find me at on my website, dramyhorneman.com. That's D-R-A-M-I-E-H-O-R-N-A-M-A-N.com. And then you can listen to my podcast, which is the Thyroid Fixer podcast. It's on all podcast platforms. And by the time this is released, Dr. Gupta, you have been, you most likely we, don't, we will have recorded your interview as well. So people can go on and listen to that. And that has a ton of great information. And of course, you can find me on Facebook. If you search for Dr. Amy Horneman on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, you'll find me on there as well. Awesome. Great. Any, any final departing word for our, for our listeners over here? You know, I'm a big advocate of having hope. I think a lot of a, a lot of the listeners are going to be in that state where they're still suffering from symptoms. They're not getting answers. Maybe they've been misdiagnosed like I was. And you have to have hope to keep going because there is an answer out there. You absolutely can feel better. This is not how you're going to feel for the rest of your life, but you might have to keep going and you might have to keep plugging away and allow that hope to pull you through. If I would have stopped the doctor number, if I would have stopped at my sister and, or if I would have stopped the doctor number four, or doctor number five, I wouldn't be here with you today. I would be 200 plus pounds, miserable with no answers because I trusted what those first three, four, or five, six doctors said. You know your body. You know when something is off. When something is off and you know it, you keep going and you have that hope in sight, knowing that somebody out there will have an answer for you and will be able to help you. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. This has been great. Tons yes. of fun. Thank you so much. You, rest, you, know, you shared so much good information. We are really grateful for that. Thank you so much.